so I'm going to tie this into the world of sci-fi. Um, could this be, uh, and, and, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to connect this with the Fermi paradox, right? The one that everybody likes to talk about cliche. Cause could this be one of the reasons, one of those great filters where, you know, if intelligence and consciousness come together, um, you know, there's a self-destruct button and then we have to restart again and it just keeps going again and again. I don't think you need even to bring consciousness into it okay. um, or even necessarily intelligence. I think it's a pretty reasonable presumption that Darwin's laws apply throughout the universe because they're really simple laws. Can they're you talk a bit about that? How so? They're yeah. almost tautological. I mean, yeah. basically, it's, it's, it's saying that, that as long as you've got a range of strategies and some of those strategies work better than others the worst strategies won't won't be able to outcompete it's not going to be a problem until you have limited resources but if you have limited resources if you have variation in your population right and that variation is heritable yeah then what you're always going to get is not the fittest, but at least the least unfit, the most adequate, will survive at the expense of those that don't. So because that seems like, I mean, it's such a simple, obvious premise. Right. It's basically glorified cause and effect. Yeah. If that's true, then it's, I think it's safe to say that the same processes that promote immediate fitness might be pretty ubiquitous throughout the universe. Right. Because natural selection has no foresight whatsoever. There's no way for the genes to look ahead and say, wow, you know, this craving for sugar is doing us really well now. <laughs> but, you know, 500 generations from now, it's going to lead to tooth rot and diabetes and, 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 you know, all sorts of brain diseases, and we should probably dial back. There's no way for the genes to do that. All that, all that natural selection can do is say, hey, this works now. I'm fitter than the next guy. Right. And But what about cooperation, right? I mean, another subset is species that tend to cooperate do better. Mm -hmm. uh, so wouldn't that also apply for, let's say, civilizations and not just human? It could be alien civilizations. Well, so the question is cooperation against what? When you look at m a lot of these things, you basically have a tribal response against an outgroup. Right. I mean, uh, there was an actual headline in the Globe and Mail back in the 1980s, probably before any of you guys were born. The headline in the Globe and Mail was, Reagan assured Gorbachev of help against space aliens. <laughs> and it had, this is not the National Enquirer. <laughs> I love it. This is the Globe Mail. And the oh. picture showed Gorbachev holding a teddy bear and waving its paw at the audience. And his argument was actually pretty cogent, which was we really wouldn't care about communism versus capitalism exactly. if we were invaded by Martians. Exactly. The thing that makes people, the thing that makes tribes cooperate is an external threat so even that is i mean i have could, a could could entropy be that threat that's something i've always played around with even in science fictional context the idea that nothing reverses entropy the concept of neg entropy apparently is intellectually incoherent but what we do as evolved organisms is we slow down entropy. We put the brakes on entropy. It's like taking a fire hose and forcing the higher fire hose, forcing the water in that fire hose to go through a million capillary tubes, right? Right. It, it slows, the, the total volume of the water still ends up and still ends up at the end of the pipe, but it takes a lot longer to get there. So the more complexity you have in the universe, further you got to wait till heat death yeah the more complexity you can build the longer the universe will live hmm. i think that's a pretty epic it's it's an idea i've played around with in a couple S of videos. you think games it's like a half-life situation where it'll never go to zero it'll just kind of 
and we, and we figure out a way because uh, a Zeno's paradox of heat death. That's what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, similar to that. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, time basically stops when energy runs out. Yeah. At some point, I mean, if the energy hasn't run out, then time will continue. At some point, the last electron flips from one way to another and everything just shuts down. Unless we have, you know, bump into another multiverse or a, a brain or whatever the the you know whatever the string theorists are talking about these days well the multiverse is, seems to be gaining more strength these days uh string theory not so much but yeah yeah one it kind of emerged yeah. from the other though wasn't it it yeah. used to be string theory now it's brain theory um in either case and i haven't read much stuff since since i read the latest and uh, one of brian uh, green's books on it but in either case there are still those who argue that it's not so much science as philosophy because how the hell can you test it? Right. I, I understand that there is some possible suggestions that we could see echoes or holes in the cosmic uh, microwave background that might suggest collisions with a previous universe. Um, and I'm certainly no expert. I think it would be very cool if we could do that. Yeah. Um, but I was surprised. I'm surprised that the brain theorists are 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 having a a resurgence. I did not realize that. 